Well, part of our post-Christian world today has more to do with attitude than arguments. In the New Apologetics, we're interested in how people are thinking, how they're living in the real world. And one of the prevailing attitudes today has to be narcissism. Well, welcome to the program, everybody. My name is Emilio Ramos. It's good to be with you. We're back for another episode of the New Apologetics, and today we are talking about the issue of narcissism. Part of the New Apologetic focus is to understand how our culture is changing because of the advent of technology, because of the rise of technological singularity, transhumanism, but also because of the rise of narcissism, hedonism, and other things in our culture that are kind of unprecedented in the way that all of those things are coming together at a feverish rate. And so in order to understand the common man, the, the man on the street, where people live their everyday lives, to understand how powerful our narcissistic age is becoming, we need to understand what narcissism is, how it works, and what the Bible has to say of the implications of narcissism, of a self-centered and self-absorbed view of yourself and your uh, humanity and your authentic realization of who you are and all of those things. But we also have to see what the Bible has to say about how narcissism plays into your total world view. Now, lying behind the drive in our narcissistic age is the desire for absolute autonomy in every area of life. And now today, I wanna to look at narcissism as it plays out in two areas, the culture and the church, because as much as it is an issue in the culture, it's also a problem for the contemporary church today. And so it becomes very, very serious for us to be able to discern how is the culture, how are these powerful factors of technology and globalism and relativistic thinking and the pursuit of self-realization and authentic humanity, how are these things playing in to the way the church is changing alongside of the culture and how can we expose these things, how can we resist these things, and what is the biblical uh, and the gospel answer to all of this. Now, in a recent study regarding what narcissism is, these are some of the key characteristics, some of the key attributes and features of narcissism that we need to be aware of. According to one study, there are really nine marks of narcissism. According to many psychiatrists, they would say that there is an overemphasis of a grandiose vision of yourself. You have an elated view of who you really are. There's also an obsession with success and with power, and you pursue success at all costs because you believe in having to maximize who you are along the lines of not only who you control, what you control, but how successful you are in the process. There's also a tendency to think that you are unique among everybody else in society, that there's something special about you that sets you apart from everybody else. That is a true mark of narcissism. But also, there's an overwhelming sense of entitlement where you believe that you are entitled and privileged among others, that you are entitled to certain things that other people are not. In addition to that, there's also a demand for excessive admiration of yourself. You require for others to admire you. And of course, we can see this in the world of Hollywood and entertainment and celebrities and pop stars everywhere. They live for the fame. They live for the applause. They live for the admiration that they can get from other human beings. In addition to that, there's also an envious streak in all narcissists where they envy what other people have. They covet what other people have and they will not stop the pursuit of those things until they obtain them. Well, in the pursuit of all those other categories, there's also a lack of empathy for your fellow man. You tend not to care for the needs and the concerns of others in the pursuit of your own self-realization. Consequently, that leads to an exploitation of the people around you. And as a matter of fact, there's an entire field of therapy and recovery programs where people can recover from having been abused by a narcissist in their lives. 
This often results, finally, in a kind of characteristic, a kind of personality that tends to dominate others, to be arrogant around others, and to take advantage of others for your own personal gain. But when we tend to think of the issue of narcissism, what you might find in the average person, the self-absorption, the need to preserve yourself, to advance yourself, to be successful among all others, to be unique, to be privileged, everything that the list of, of, uh, of characteristics was given there by various psychiatrists and various studies that have been recently done in this area. But as we think about that, the issue of religious pluralism is not detached because really religious pluralism is another aspect of narcissism. It's the desire to have religion our way. And today the customization of spirituality is everywhere. You hear the slogan repeatedly in our culture that I am spiritual, but I'm not religious. That's another way of saying that I want religion my way. I want spirituality that is, is custom to the way that I live. It's the way that I feel. It's the way that I think I'm entitled to things in this life. It really has nothing to do with true religion. It really has nothing to do with an authentic relationship with God. And this is something that we've talked about in previous episodes that ironically, in a world that is obsessed with pursuing self, self-realization, self-autonomy, in the end, at the end of the process, self itself is lost. Now this attitude of narcissism has real life implications and has everything to do with the evangelistic task and the task of apologetics to be able to expose to people their their real awareness of their worldview or their lack thereof the idea in apologetics is that we bring people to an epistemological self-consciousness what is epistemological self-consciousness well that is the idea that we make people self-aware of who they really are, what they really believe, and what is the true nature of their worldview. Now, many people are not epistemically self-aware. They don't understand that in believing something like yoga is okay, that they are in fact embracing a Hindu and an Eastern spirituality that is ultimately unbiblical. That would be one example of how people are technically not epistemologically self-conscious. Now, I just basically speak of that in terms of being self-aware. And today in the culture, when we think about where people lack the self-awareness, the issue of narcissism is very, very important and very relevant to the discussion. Now, we can begin by talking about the deconstruction of the self. And this happens all over the culture, and this happens in everyday life when we think about what's happening in the area of gender and sexuality and transhumanism as the next step of evolution, as people's desire to re-identify themselves, to have no ultimate identity. See, today what's happening is a total deconstruction of anthropology. That's why the self can be deconstructed because there's nothing essential about being human anymore. Now we can identify being human in a myriad of different ways. And something like gender just becomes elastic. You can change it, you can stretch it, and you can turn it into anything that you want. Now add to this our digital lives. Add to this our technologically driven selves. Now today people are looking to customize their lives along the realm of what is digital. And so all of our devices, even our homes, today we're dealing with smartphones, smart cars, smart houses. Today we can control our homes with a tap of a button on the screen of our phones halfway around the world. It's truly remarkable how this technology has increased, but it's also incredible and important for us to realize how this technology is producing a certain type of narcissistic person, a person that thinks they can have everything at their fingertips, a person that thinks that everything should be microwave oven, everything should be instantaneous in other words, your food should come to you instantaneous, your products that you're buying online should arrive instantaneously, and likewise your state of happiness, your tranquility, your peace, your status in life, your 
your standards in life. All of those things should be achieved in order to gratify yourself as quickly as possible. And this too is an incredible factor in the present narcissistic age that we're living in. From digital customization to consumer-driven society, we really now live in a culture that attempts to tailor everything according to our likes, our preferences, according to our desires, according to the way that we envision ourselves and the way that we want reality to be. What is happening in culture today and the way that it's changing the modern psyche, if I can use that term, is that it's conditioning us to think that we can create reality along our own lines and that there's nothing essential about anthropology, but there's nothing essential about society either. Society can change, we can turn it into whatever we want so that ultimately the world becomes our playground and we can change it into whatever future, whatever reality that we can imagine with our own minds and that we can produce at the power of our own will. This is also leading to a drastic rise in narcissism and people don't even realize that this is the culture, this is the milieu that we're growing up with. And the children of today will become the narcissists of tomorrow, where they cannot imagine having to wait, having to develop patience, having to develop character that is long-suffering, empathetic, that cares about other people. The game of life will be all about customizing everything around you to suit your immediate needs as quickly as possible. If we think this will not have a drastic impact on the way that people think and on the way that people live their lives, we will be sorely mistaken. While we may think that this has a ring of freedom to it, the idea to be able to customize everything in our lives to suit our needs, at the end of the day, we're simply preparing people to be materialistically conditioned, to have instincts that are consumer-based and everything is conditioned around the self. This is truly idolatry. And in this idolatrous world that we live in, we have seen an unashamed rise of humanism. And this is why apologetics has everything to do with the present rise in narcissism all around us in the culture. Humanism is another worldview. Humanism is a worldview that says that man is the measure of everything and that man essentially needs nothing outside of themselves. Now think about that from the perspective of the gospel, that the central tenet of the gospel is that what we really need fundamentally, what is essential for man's goodness, happiness, joy, and eternal beatitude lies outside of us, beyond us. We look to a foreign and an alien source of righteousness, that's what the doctrine of justification is all about, we look to an alien source of happiness and joy, and that is what the beatific vision of the Christian life is all about, that one day we will arrive at Canaan's shore, we will gaze upon the face of God, and that we will behold the beauty of our Creator, of our Maker, for all of eternity in eternal joy and bliss. All of this Humanism seeks to undermine and seeks to supplant and replace by putting man on the throne, by making man the creator, that man is able to create himself, to reimagine himself and reimagine the world around him according to his own desires, according to his own schemes, his own imagination and what he thinks will ultimately make him or her happy in the end. Narcissism today has real life consequences and we can see that in the culture today in the area of abortion. Abortion, one of the true sinister social evils of our day, is nothing more than a, a monument to the idolatrous obsession that we have with self-preservation, self-realization, the desire to ultimately be about yourself 
even if that means killing your own offspring in order to achieve the highest state of whatever happiness or state of life or status in life that you want to maintain, if you want to remain single, if you don't want the burden of children and the trials that come with raising a family, well then you simply get rid of your kids through abortion, and which is murder. To see just how bad our culture is today, we have seen videos and we have seen headlines and we have all seen those feeds on Twitter and those posts that people put up where they are gloating and boasting in their abortions. They are gloating on, about the fact that they are on their way to murder their children and they're, and they're happy about it. They're, they're, they're reveling in it. And it's a true sign of just how barbaric narcissism can be. Part of the deception of the modern day rise of narcissism is the belief that there is a humility in society today, that we really do care about our neighbor, that we really do care about the interests of others. However, as part of the overall system of what we're watching, a consumer-driven system, an entertainment-obsessed system, a system, a social order that is hypersexual and hedonistic, None of those things provide for true empathy for your fellow man. All of those things are simply designed to feed the lusts and the desires that everybody has for self-advancement, which is itself narcissism. And so there's a sense in which many people are not even aware of how the entire social structure that we're living in today is actually fundamentally geared towards narcissism and discourages the biblical worldview of self-denial. Sadly today, this narcissistic self-absorption is also in the church. And there are several factors that have taken shape in the last generation in evangelicalism that shows us this very thing. These characteristics can be seen in today's obsession with the celebrity pastor. Today we can go to a Christian conference and we can see certain Christian speakers that are essentially unapproachable, that are inaccessible, they're surrounded by entourages, they're more powerful than celebrities. You can't even go up and approach a certain pastor, a certain speaker at a certain Christian concert or a conference or at a meeting of some kind. Even in the church, there are such mega churches where the pastor is treated like a celebrity with in his own church right after the service is over he's whisked away by security and let out the back door so he can escape and get into his car and go home this is absolutely fundamentally a sign that the church itself has fallen prey to this narcissistic obsession with self and has completely lost sight of what it means to engage in biblical self-denial in the way that Jesus taught and in the way that the New Testament instructs us to live our lives. Now several signs need to be pointed out when we think about the narcissism that has crept into the church. We're reminded of the emergent church, for example. Now the emergent church has essentially gone out of fashion in terms of an organized group. The Rob Bells of the world, the, the Brian McLarens of the world. By and large, those types of emergent leaders are gone, many of them completely apostate. But the tenets, the tactics, the techniques, and the characteristics of the emergent church have not gone away. As a matter of fact, they have proliferated and they can be found in many evangelical churches today in all sorts of different characteristics, all sorts of different tendencies and techniques for ministry that show us that the emergent church is really alive and well. It has really done the damage that we thought it would do and as, as we see manifestations of it all over the church today. And some of these characteristics today is that we desire uh, conversations, not sermons. We desire quality talkers instead of quality preachers. We want relatable pastors instead of theologians. Churches shrink if the service is too traditional and the people are too serious. The youth is disconnected if the sermons are not funnier, hip, or cool, or cultural, or if they don't feature a 
trailer from a recent blockbuster film. Emergent models have also given rise to feminine men in leadership, which is now seen more of a virtue than a shame. And while much of the femininity that we see in the church today may not be from a result of overt homosexuality, there is still an effeminate trait that pervades the church in the 21st century. And this is something that as a church we need to be extremely self-conscious about. That somehow along the path we have allowed for men to use feminine tones, to act feminine, to be metrosexual, and to engage in much of the feminizing of men that our culture has engaged in. And even in the church, that's begun to be looked upon as cool and hip and relevant, that it's nice and it's likable and relatable. And sadly, that has eroded the foundations of true biblical masculinity, strength, leadership, and what the church really needs out of its leaders to be strong, competent men, brave, chivalrous and not afraid to confront things and not afraid to lead in the church. Sadly today, men are even in the church walking around using feminine tones where they sound more like women than the women. This is a true sad development within the church of the 21st century. It's not popular and it's not something that people want to talk about, but it is an aspect of the way that our narcissistic culture has infected the church and how the church has assimilated attributes, characteristics, social traits of the culture to its own demise. From feminine men and leadership to all-out egalitarian practices in the church. I recently visited the Evangelical Theological Society here in Texas, and uh, there was a 60-page handout of all the speakers that were going to lecture theology at the conference. I was amazed to see just how many women were gonna be lecturing theology over men in this conference. Now, despite whatever your conviction is regarding whether or not women can teach over men, and let's say yet not be pastors, and you might identify as a complementarian in that way, but something is changing when we look at what's happening, even in Christian leadership, where many of the commentaries, the critical, exegetical, expository commentaries that are being used to equip the, the preacher and the pastor in the church today are being written by women. Women today are writing not only commentaries, but they're actually instructing men on homiletics. For women today, many of them now have positions in leadership in the church. They're given titles such as minister of this and minister of that. More women are now in positions where they lead the congregation and worship with no male leadership whatsoever. More women are now discontent with their church if they are not allowed to lead or teach in some capacity, especially over men. And more women are now even being allowed to speak as keynote speakers in popular evangelicals and even reformed conferences. Now these examples go on and on and on. Now again, we have to come back to what is all this grounded in? This is all grounded in a narcissistic desire of autonomy, to have it our way, to make religion the way we want it to be in order to maximize our success, our happiness. Now if that sounds familiar, that's exactly what's going on in the culture. The culture is being uh, fed this worldview. And it's not surprising in the culture, and it su shouldn't surprise anybody. But when those things are found within the church, it should be alarming, it should be concerning, and we should be ready to confront it. We should be ready to, to, to teach against it and preach directly against such narcissistic and autonomous ways of thinking, even theologically, and in terms of the practice of leadership, the models of leadership, and the models of ministry that we're allowing and that we are adopting in the local church. It matters at the ground level, and we need to respond to that biblically. But the church is also becoming deconstructed in many ways. We are becoming an ahistorical church. For many Christians today, especially within the evangelical, non-denominational world, there is an emphasis on a non-historical approach to Scripture. Now, I myself came from Calvary Chapel. And in many Calvary chapels back in the 90s, 
I remember that for Calvary Chapel, you got almost a sense that Calvary Chapel was detached from Christendom, that Chuck Smith and the movement that he began in the 60s during the the sexual revolution and the hippie movement and all of that, and the Jesus movement that followed that, was really sort of an isolated event in church history. And for many Christians during that time, and in a movement like Calvary Chapel, you began to sort of disconnect yourself from church history so that you didn't even understand that there were things like councils, confessions, and creeds, that there was a whole history of the Reformation that had been built up until then, and that you lost an understanding of historical theology. You lost an understanding of the way that, uh, the way that Christian thought developed over the centuries. And today in Christianity, an ahistorical approach to Christianity is not only tolerated, but celebrated. Other aspects of narcissism having crept into the church today is the idea of music-driven ministries and churches, and also the idea of the prosperity movement, which may be one of the greatest examples of utter narcissism that now permeates many Christian churches, if they can be called Christian at all. But if we think about the music industry in the Christian realm, then we understand that we have adopted so many of the characteristics, the fashions, the modes, and the culture of the world. That is not a good thing because much of that is rooted in a unbiblical narcissism and an unbiblical self-absorption where once again everything is conditioned and tailored to our like. Everything is conditioned and tailored to our own personal preferences and it just exalts the autonomous nature, the sinful nature, the sinful autonomy within all of us. And this too is something that we should be ready to confront. For in many Churches, it has all become about Sony quality music, performance driven worship, concert feel euphoria of a spirituality. The emergence of contemporary Christian worship has given rise to what Philip Reef called the triumph of the therapeutic. And this is something that we must be ready to, and again, this is all a push for self discovery, to come into an authentic humanity. And many, really, in many churches today, it has become a very popular talking point to talk about having the best version of yourself. And that this is something you should be pursuing at all costs. And the best version of yourself usually is a way of talking about your own personal happiness. And this personal happiness typically consists not of theology, not of doctrine, not of authentic spirituality by way of repentance and faith, but really happiness by way of maximizing your success, by having an ideal family, an ideal status, by having an ideal marriage and an ideal lifestyle, and, and, and having the things that you want in this world. The Prosperity Church is perhaps the worst example of this, where today the Prosperity Church is all about financial success. It's all about your bank account. It's all about what you do with your money and how God can help you get more stuff. But all of this narcissism has also created this culture within the church that we simply go to the church we want when that church fulfills us in what we really like. And so we, we check off churches like a list. We, we shop for churches the way that you shop for things at the mall. You go from one shop to the other. If this store doesn't have what you're looking for, you just leave and you go over to the next store. And many people are just consumer driven when they approach the subject of the local church and whether or not they're going to retain membership in that church. And the minute that church disappoints you in any way, like a consumer, you go shopping for something better. As we think about the gospel today in our modern context, and we remember that Jesus really lived in a countercultural way. Matter of fact, Jesus and the gospel and the message that he came to preach was the complete opposite of what we hear today in our culture in terms of being what, what it means to be authentically human. And so that what Jesus taught 
is diametrically opposed to what the culture is saying today about what it means to be authentically human and what it means to engage in self-realization and self-discovery. For Jesus, the answer lied in abasement. The answer lied in going low, of, of coming down, that the first shall be last and the last shall be first and that the greatest among us would be the servant of all. See, the ethics of the gospel is not from this world. The ethics of the gospel belongs to a higher order. It belongs to the order of the heavenly kingdom of God. And in God's kingdom, it's not about asserting yourself. It's not about advancing yourself. It's not about achieving a greater version of yourself through your own effort. What you can bring to the table, how successful you're going to be on the basis of your, your wealth or your beauty or your fame or your position in life, in culture, in politics, and in society. The gospel is completely the opposite of these kinds of cultural slogans today. And that is only going to be realized through regeneration as people undergo repentance and faith, as people turn away from self-seeking and look to Christ alone for all of the answers of what it means to be authentically human and how that amounts to our joy and our eternal happiness in the kingdom of God. And so as we think about how the gospel fixes the problems of narcissism today, Jesus invites people to throw away their lives. In fact, Jesus calls people to hate their lives in this world. So that for Jesus, it is not the allucrements of this life, what you can get at the mall, what you can purchase online, how many gadgets you can acquire, how many apps you can you can use throughout the day and how much technology and how much stuff can clutter your life. But it's also not a quest of self-discovery where we go inward, where we look to ourselves, where we look to the power within. No, everything in the gospel is about an alien righteousness that resides outside of us. It directs us away from ourselves and to the cross where all the answers for mankind are really found. That is the only way the gospel will fix the problems of modern narcissism. Oh, how I long to bring hope to the masses But I am blind to the need right in front of me